Hi, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries, continuing our series on the war in Israel. Uh, you know, God says in His Word that Israel, the nation of Israel, is the apple of His eye. <laughs> so, uh, you want to mess with Israel? <laughs> mess around and find out. Hey, Amen. Listen. Truth is reality as perceived by God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your word. We ask you now to open up your word and help us to understand what's going on in the world better. In Jesus' name, amen. That's right. Truth is reality as perceived by God. Doesn't matter what historians have written. It doesn't matter what political commentators are saying. It doesn't matter what the news says. It doesn't matter what the United Nations says. It doesn't matter what the president says. It doesn't matter what anybody says because all men are liars. Uh, the only place that you're going to find absolute 100% truth is here. Thy word is truth. The only 100% pure and perfect thing on the face of this planet is God's pure, perfect, and preserved words in your King James Holy Bible. Amen. So when we want to understand what's going on in the world, <laughs> go to God. <laughs> Don't go to the news. Don't go to the political commentators. Don't go to the historians. Go to God and you'll get the, you'll get the real down low. Amen. All right. Well, let's see some things that God says about this nation of Israel. Amen. Uh, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, truth is established. So I'll give you two prophets. Amen. And since we're in Las Vegas, Nevada, I'll do it like we're at the card table. I'll see you, your two prophets, and raise you four prophecies. Amen. So here's four prophecies from two prophets. Uh, and this is what God says about his nation, Israel. Start with me in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, that's Jesus, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time <laughs> to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Jeremiah chapter 32. Verses 37 through 40. <laughs> Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries, whether I have driven them in mine anger, and in my fury, and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Chapter 46, Jeremiah. Verse 27. The 
But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and be in rest, and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee. Let's get this. I will make a full end of all nations. That includes the U.S. Whether I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. And then back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 40. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more." Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, Whenever God repeats something, doubles something, you better pay attention. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. God's promises and covenant with the nation of Israel, these are unconditional. They will be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of David, will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and through the Jewish nation will rule and reign this earth for a thousand years according to your King James Holy Bible. Now, if you want to try to go in and say God didn't mean what he said, see, that's what people do. Uh, that's, that's where you get this... Uh, replacement theology that, oh, no, all those promises were transferred to, the, transferred to the church. No, they weren't. You got Jew, you got Gentile, you got Church of God. Things that differ are not the same. You cannot take the promises of God to the nation of Israel and hang them on the church. Oh, now listen, the church does receive the spiritual benefit of the promises to the nation of Israel. We are grafted in, but that don't, that don't mean that Israel has ceased to be in Israel. Israel's Israel, and we just read it over and over again, that they're going to be brought into their land, and they're going to be in that land, and they're going to they're be restored. Now, they haven't been restored spiritually yet. They've only been restored physically to that land. And we've, we have seen that. In, the li in either our lifetimes or the lifetime of our parents, we have seen the miracle of, of a nation that had been dispersed, scattered, and gone for almost 2,000 years, and God performs the miracle of bringing them back and planting them back in the land the second time, just like he said he would before he comes back to set up his kingdom. The physical, the physical restoration has happened. The spiritual restoration, well, that's what the tribulation is before is for. That's why it's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's Daniel's 70th, 70th week. The tribulation is for the Jews. The tribulation is not part 
of the dispensation of the church, the dispensation of the grace of God. So when, when you move into the tribulation, this is a different dispensation. We're going, God is going back to dealing with the nation of Israel to restore the nation of Israel and to fulfill all the prophetic promises to that nation during the tribulation period. So what has to happen? Well, we, the, the church age needs to come to an end, right? For blindness in part has happened unto Israel until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles. So once the last Gentile is saved and uh, the body of Christ is full, amen, God blows his trumpet, we're out of here. Now we come to the next dispensation. That's the tribulation. And uh, that that is for Israel. That's where they will be spiritually restored and go in to that promised kingdom. Amen. So listen, <laughs> mess around with Israel and find out. <laughs> God, is, God, God has planted them there and, and there's nothing ever going to move them out of that land right now. You can try. Uh, historically, it's kind of interesting. I'll, 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 read, you, I'll read you some stuff here uh, real quick. All right. So what you see here, <laughs> here's a, the running history of five Jewish wars. <laughs> Amen. The first wave of, uh, of immigration of Jews back to Palestine began in 1881 in, in Russia and, and ran till uh, 1903. It was called the first Aliyah. And 35,000 Jews got into the land. In the second Aliyah, 1904 through 1914, 40,000 more got in. Uh, 40,000 more got in in the third Aliyah, uh, 1919 through 1923. 82,000 got in in the fourth Aliyah, 1924 to 1929. And by 1940, the fifth Aliyah, 1929 through 1939, 250,000 more Jews, immigrants, got in. The first uh, anti-Jewish violence after World War I was on May 1st, 1921. In August 1929, a Jewish boy was stabbed to death by Muslims for kicking a soccer ball into an Arab garden. Uh, when the Jews went to the Wailing Wall to pray, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem preached a rouser to the Arab Muslims, and there followed two days of killing, August 22nd through 23rd, in which 133 Jews were murdered. In 1936, the British had to train the Jews to defend themselves against the Arab revolt. In July 7th of 1937, the Peel Commission asked for the dual partition of Palestine. On August 3rd, 1937, the World Zionist Congress accepted that recommendation. The Arabs, however, rejected it on September 8th, 1937. The Muslims refused an invitation to London to meet with the Jews. And, October, and on October 2nd, 1937, they killed 20 more civilians. The Muslims sided with Hitler in 1939. In fact, in November of 1941, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem visited Hitler and ended up staying in Berlin through the rest of the war. In 1947, when England opted to leave Palestine and turn Israel over to the UN, the Muslims said that they would not abide by any decision. In November of 1947, the Arab League pressed for a total Muslim population of Palestine with no Jews allowed in it. The British mandate was to end in May of 1948. From January to March of 1948, Arabs infiltrated pa Palestine. The first car bombing by the Arabs took place in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem on February 22nd of 1948. On May 14th, 1948, uh, David Ben-Gurion announced the independence of the state of Israel. On May 15, 1948, five Muslim nations attacked Israel. The, la the war lasted until June 10th of 1948. Israel whipped Allah so bad that he had to run to the United Nations for help to force a truce on the Jews before they could enter the Islamic portions of Jerusalem. The Mohammedans broke the truce 28 days later on July 8th in 1949 Israel signed a separate ceasefire with all five nations. In May of 1951, the Syrians attacked Israel in Galilee. 
By then, Israel had been boycotted by all Muslim nations for two years. In 1951, the Palestinians bragged about killing Jews for the next 35 years. They were joined by Hamas in 1987. They murdered 147 Jews in 1952, 162 in 1953, 180 in 1954, and 238 in 1955. In August of 1955, they were officially joined by the Egyptians who launched attacks against Israel citizens from Gaza. Eisenhower and the UN did nothing. In 1956, the Egyptians closed off the Gulf of Aqaba to Israel shipping. This, along with the Egyptian Fadayeen attacks from Gaza, prompted Israel to invade the Sinai Peninsula. Once more, the UN had to come to Allah's aid and force Israel to give the Gaza Strip back to Egypt so more terrorist attacks could be launched from there. In 1964, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was formed as a terrorist organi organization dedicated to Jewish genocide. Yasser Arafat, the founder of its military branch, the Palestinian Liberation Army, was the nephew of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who Hitler had sheltered in Berlin throughout World War II. Arafat was not a Palestinian at all. He was an Egyptian whom the Quran said wound up in hell for marrying a French Catholic. Kennedy, Johnson, and the UN did nothing to stop the PLO attacks. In 1967, the Six-Day War. May, the Mohammedans deployed along the Israeli frontier and asked the UN to remove all protection from Israel. Israel was outnumbered by the Arabs three to one. June 5th, Israel launched a preemptive strike against Egypt. June 6th, Israel drove Jordan from the West Bank. June 9th, Israel attacked Syrian positions on the Golan Heights. Terrorism in Israel. <laughs> so much. 1973, Yom Kippur War. Egypt attacked Israel again with Russian equipment. Syrian attacks simultaneously on the Golan Heights. 1,400 Syrian tanks were against 180 Israeli tanks. Israel retakes the Golan Heights and uses their position to enter Syria. October 14, one of the largest tank battles in history, Israel destroyed 264 Egyptian tanks while losing only 40 itself. The 1982 Israeli-Lebanese War. To end the PLO threat in Lebanon, Israel launched its fifth major war, June 6, Israel invaded Lebanon, including Tyr and Sidon, which the PLO had used as bases of operation. Fifteen miles of Beirut was destroyed by Soviet-made surface-to-air missiles, which Russia had supplied to the PLO. In one of the largest jet battles in history, Syria lost 86 planes, while the Jews lost none. They just keep attacking. They just keep attacking. They just keep attacking. We talked about that in the last video. This is this doctrine of Hudna and Al-Takir. It's like this. It's like you get in a fight with somebody, and when they start losing, they go, okay, I give, I give, I give. And then the referee breaks them up. <laughs> then they go over. <laughs> they heal up. <laughs> they get new weapons, and they come back and attack again. You know, Listen, <laughs> let me give you a little prison tier illustration. If I'm on the prison tier, and I get in a fight with somebody, and I whoop him, and he's, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's all good. And we shake hands, and we hug it out. It's supposed to be all good. And as soon as I turn my head, he comes flying across the room and tries to hit me again. How many times am I going to keep falling for that same trick? Hey, man, here's what's been said, and it's very true. If all of the Muslims laid down their arms there'd be no more war. If all of the Jews laid down their arms, there'd be no more Jews. See what I'm saying? The Jews aren't looking for trouble. The Jews trying to live in peace there, but the Islam, the very Quran of Islam, says a dozen times, the very aim and objective of that religion is to kill the Jews and drive them out of the land. That's what that religion is about. It's about cutting off their heads and wiping out that whole race of people who we know are God's people. Good luck. Mess around with Israel and find out. See, 
this whole we we covered this too that this this whole Palestinian issue is smoke and mirrors. Um, we talk about we talk about Israel. We talk about Jerusalem. After the resurrection of Christ, it was attacked by Titus in A.D. seventy. All right, wiped it out. Wiped it out. The J Jews went into dispersion. The Romans attacked again in AD 135, then the Persians, AD 614, under Shabbatas, the Muslims in AD 638, under Umar, the Catholic Crusaders in AD 1099, Saladin in AD 1187, the Karazamin hordes in AD 1244, plus 14 more times. At no time, this, listen to this, key in. At no time after A.D. 70, when Israel was dispersed, was Jerusalem or Palestine connected with any kind of state. At no time did either contain a governing body over Palestine. At no time was there ever in Palestine any Palestinians with any culture, language, speech, government, or even history. In 1939, long before the Liberation War of 1948, there were banks in Palestine for French, English, Germans, and post offices for Russians and Italians. They were all Palestinians. Palestine was a Turkish mandate before it became a British mandate in 1917. A Palestinian, according to history, instead of the religious creed of Egyptian terrorists, would be an Englishman, a Turk, a Greek, an Arab, a Russian, a Persian, a Jebusite, a Canaanite, a Frenchman, an Italian, a Spaniard, or Jordanian, or a Sicilian, or whoever happened to be living in the region of Palestine, which has never been a nation. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. Don't believe the hype. And guess what? Mess around with Israel and find out. There's one more big war coming. After the body of Christ is taken out of here, in this period of Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble that we call the tribulation, when that happens, the Antichrist will gather the armies of the world and they will all come against Jerusalem. When one last final ditch effort to drive the Jews out of Jerusalem and to wipe them from the face of the earth. And in the last moment, when all hope seems gone, hallelujah. That sky is going to split. Amen. <laughs> oh, let's just read it. Let's just read it. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Go to Revelation <laughs> chapter 19. Huh? In that last, <laughs> all the world's coming. All the world, the armies of the world under the Antichrist gathered together. He said, I'm going to make an end of all nations. Amen. <laughs> he said, nice, verse 11. Revelation 19, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and he has on his head, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's right. <laughs> He's coming back. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will take his seat 
on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and he will restore the nation of Israel, and he will rule through the nation of Israel, this earth, for a thousand years, and fulfill literally in every little detail, every single word that he promised to them in prophecy in the Old Testament. You don't need to spiritualize it. You don't need to allegorize it. <laughs> you don't need to try to make it refer to the church. No, God said what he meant, said what he meant, when he said it, where he said it, how he said it, and he meant it literally, and he's going to do it. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to believe. It's not a matter of here. It's a matter of here. Do you have an evil heart of unbelief? Do you doubt the living words of the living God, where he said them, how he said them, literally? That's a heart problem. <laughs> That's not a scholarship problem. You just believe what God says. It's going to come to pass. And again, <laughs> mess with Israel and find out. <laughs> God bless you. I love you. We'll see you on the next one.